Happy Saturday, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to your first edition of Collider Mailbag for this wonderful weekend. I am Perry Nemiroff, and I have John Roca here with me today. How you doing? I'm doing great. I heard there was an Avengers 4 trailer coming, so I got my Avengers guys out just in case. Just in case the, it drops while we're recording Mailbag, I can immediately make the transition with Gamora and Thanos, Doctor Strange, uh, Iron Man, I think the end, Spider-Man. By the way, in the Spider-Verse, go see it when it comes out. It's so good. All those right. are cool. Where'd yeah. you get those? A friend of mine gave them to me who works uh, for Marvel Marketing. So he, came, Ooh, he brought friends him Friends in high places. Well, you know, people have been questioning my friends now lately. They're going, who are these friends Roka talks about? They're my friends. All They're right. legitimate. I believe it. Thank you. So <laughs> this is the show where we get to answer your viewer-submitted questions. And you hopefully at this point know where they all come from. Four places. Email. And that email is mailbag at collider.com. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Keep sending them in. Just a helpful tip that I might have repeated before, short and sweet. Uh, we were admiring a couple of wonderful, very long questions that we got the other day that mm. were great, and we do read them all, but we can't read gigantic paragraphs. So yeah. please keep that in mind. Also, this show does not only exist in video form. Check it out on the podcast feed as well. We are on the Movie Talk feed, so tell everybody you know about that. All right. Yeah. All the business is taken care of. Good job. You ready to jump into it? If you're listening on the podcast feed... This is my voice and I'm ready. <laughs> I'm glad we clarified that because they never would have known. All right. The first question today is an email from Ninja Transformers who writes, after it made $123 million in September last year, 10 of the 12 months had at least one $100 million opening weekend. The only two months that don't have one yet are January and October. Will either month achieve this in the next three to five years? Oh, well, Ninja Transformer, let me tell you something. We, we, we might not even have to wait three to five years. Next January, this Jan this upcoming January, Glass comes out. Glass certainly could break 100 million. There's been so much hoopla around that movie, and these trailers have been fantastic. People are amped all across the board, so there's certain possibilities that uh, January will certainly fall already to 100 million. And you know, we've been inching closer. American Sniper, although it opened limited on Christmas, it had opened to 89 million that January. Then there was, uh, then there was a uh, ride along with 41, Kung Fu Panda, Cloverfield, and Split around 40 with Revenant at 39. So we had we made that jump with Sniper. Now I think possibly uh, Glass will do that 100 million as well. And then when you look at October, Venom came real close in October with that 80 million dollar opening, Perry. But you look at October, the Joker movie, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie comes out in October of 2019 next year. That certainly has possibilities to break 100 million. Zombieland 2 also comes out, and the Tom Hanks Mr. Rogers movie is currently scheduled to come out in October. But the big thing is this, if Terminator 6 moves back one day, or one week rather, into October from November 1st, it could also break the 100 million. So to me, three to five years, we don't have to wait that long. I think I think we might break next year, it might break the 100 million dollars both in January and October next year. Anyone who enjoys my very expressive uh, facial reaction <laughs> was probably just having a field day. I think the only title that you named that I didn't, like my face didn't contort was probably the Joker movie. Mm -hmm. I do think that Glass is going to do very well in January. And I think really in answering this question, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, this yeah, this is really bound is. to happen. We're constantly talking about the changing landscape mm -hmm. with these movies in terms of box office possibility. I mean, really, just recently, whoever would have thought that it, of all movies, would have made as much as it did the first weekend in mm -hmm. September. And now, all of a sudden, that is a hot time for horror movies to open. Mm -hmm. So... Things are changing. It is bound to happen. I don't think, as much as I think Glass is going to do well, I don't think it's coming anywhere close to $100 million. Really? You don't think Any, so? Anywhere close. Wow. Split opened with $40 million, and that was a huge deal. I do suspect that if Glass mm. is good, it is going to top Split, but $100 million is a completely different level. Wow. Joker, I think, could be mm -hmm. a surprise, especially... Especially this year, after Venom opened as big as it did, when there were so many doubts in mm -hmm. the air. And also, when you look at Venom and see how far it's gone since that major opening, I don't know, I just have a feeling that Joker could be sitting in the perfect position that if this movie really is fantastic, it could be the one to actually cross that line, but oh, well, okay. I don't know. It still, it still all feels like yeah. a little bit of a stretch because 100 million is a lot of money, mm -hmm. but I do think in the changing landscape, 
it's only a matter of time before January and October hit that milestone. Certainly. Uh, the, with Split, I would push back a little with Perry and say, well, people were trepidatious with M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong, wondering if he was going to get it right with Split, because those last few movies were terrible. And so The him Visit studying, is not terrible. The Visit, fine. But mm -hmm. uh, those three before The Visit were absolutely not good, didn't do any business at the box office, so much so that they weren't even, seen, even saying his name in the promos for some of those trailers. That tells you how far he'd fallen down. But coming back with Split, the excitement of that, this is a different parameter, set of parameters, and so maybe it has a, that's why I think it has possibility. And uh, the Joker, though, what you said is, is absolutely right. I think that's the one that feels like the bigger bet, the best bet of all the films coming out next year in January and in October to possibly break that 100 million. If Split opens with 100 million or more, I will buy you a bowl of macaroni and cheese from Wood Ranch. I don't... <laughs> Deal? <laughs> okay, deal. Deal. A full-size bowl. No, not that side stuff. The no, no, no. I'll, right. I'll buy you. Yeah. All right. We're, we're going all out with this. <laughs> Let's do it. I God love mac and you. cheese. All right. Next question, Roca. All right. This, comes, this is an email from Charles Rojas. He writes, greetings to the Collider crew. Hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did. I know Perry did. I watched your video from Movie Talk last week discussing best sports movies. I was a little disappointed from my fellow Virginians, Ellis and Roca, that no one mentioned Remember the Titans. I was even more disappointed on Roca's view on Rudy. Absolutely a great sports movie. Go Irish. See, you're biased. You don't know what you're talking about. Okay, with, my, that, with all that said, here is my question. What true sports story would you like to see made into a movie? I would like to see something about the 1992 Dream Team, the steroid scandal in, the, in Major League Baseball in the late 90s, and a story on the UFC starting from being banned in many states to its modern day success. Just curious on your thoughts. Thanks and have a wonderful holidays this year. So the first thing that came to mind mm -hmm. when I read this question, because I'm just so deep in it right now and yeah. so obsessed with it. <laughs> have we ever had a movie about fantasy sports? I know this no. isn't really the question, but it crossed my mind. We've, we've never had like a full movie. Not a about... full movie. There have been scenes, but yeah. not a full movie. No, there's been documentaries. There was one documentary about it, but that's it. What's the documentary it's, called? But it's not on fantasy football. It's on fantasy baseball. Okay. And it's about how fantasy started. Well, I'm first still, I'm, I'm panicking right now about okay when fantasy football is over because I'm going to miss it so much. Yeah. So maybe I need some, some other sports options yeah. to, okay. to keep that part for my life intact well, what, now that I'm addicted. It's a 30 for 30 documentary on Netflix. You can okay. watch it about, uh, uh, about fantasy baseball and it Good starts, to it's know. called Rotisserie something. Well, I do think we need a, a fantasy sports movie. I okay. think, I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. It's great. But the proper answer to this question, I think for me would be um, Japan winning the uh, the world women's World Cup. Mm -hmm. Just given what was going on at that time with what they were dealing with, with the earthquake and the tsunami, that story has so many incredible, inspiring mm -hmm. layers to it. It just seems so ripe for a big screen adaptation. And an achievement like that is something well worth repeating and possibly sharing with a wider viewership that wasn't even aware of it when it was actually happening. It's so funny you say that because one of my selections is uh, the U.S. national team, women's team, winning the World Cup four years after to yeah. avenge their loss to Japan <laughs> because of all that went around with them and all the, the, the uh, kind of criticism they took for not for beating Brazil in the semis in such an incredible way off Abby Wambach's header, but then not being able to get the job done against the Japanese. So to have to come back four years later and win it with all the drama around Hope Solo, with Abby Wambach's last few games, and with Megan Rapinoe really emerging as a powerful force on the team, that would be a fun story to watch. But absolutely, the mm -hmm. Japanese team sorry deserves their own sports story. Uh, uh, another one, I want to throw this out specifically for Perry. Perry might be interested in this. The Milwaukee Brewers Brewers have a hotel called Fister Hotel, and a lot of players won't stay there because they claim that it is haunted. And they think that they, they said that they have had moving furniture, creepy footsteps, electronics that turn on by themselves, and strange apparitions that appear in the hotel. This, in, in 2010, the San Francisco Giants players Edgar Renteria and Pablo Sandoval refused to stay in the hotel, and they stayed at a different place down the street because of their experiences in the hotel. So a horror film a horror affecting sports movie. a horror sports movie affecting a sports team at a critical moment would be a fun sports movie to, oh, to have done. My, my mind is blown, <laughs> Roka. You win. I will get you that bowl of macaroni and cheese anyway. No, but a lot of, there's, there are a number of hotels and you can do research on this, Perry, in the sports world. There are a number of hotels in different sports that people will not, teams won't stay in because oh, yeah. they claim it's haunted. They're haunted and people like just, they, they have, there's video, they claim their stories. 
all kinds of stuff. I would even want to have like a story or even a documentary about sports mm. superstitions. Yeah, oh, like, I'm God. fascinated by that. I've got enough of my own, yeah. so I can't even imagine playing a professional sport on a week to week basis. All the things that would just add up and go through my mind. Yeah. Well, my last selection is uh, the 2004 Red Sox. And as a Yankees fan, really hard for me to say this sitting next to a fellow New Yorker as well. But they, they them winning the World Series in 2004, coming back down, what, 3 0 in the ALCS after my Yankees had just whipped them 19 to 7 or something like that. No one thought it was possible. Uh, and seeing David Ortiz, Manny Ramirez, Johnny Damon, all those guys come together, rally, and win that series, and then win the World Series. That was full of incredible characters. What do you need for a good sports movie? Baseball movie especially is great characters. The 2004 Red Sox certainly had that. Okay, I'm into that too. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think these are some great options, great opportunities for sports movies because I can't get enough of them. Oh, well, all right, go. next time? Yeah. All right, here we go. It's an email from Sam. Ooh, short and sweet. Who writes, a lot of love, <laughs> for Into the Spider-Verse right now, you think it's going to win the Oscar? I think this is a great question. And <laughs> I would say to you, my personal feeling is I, if I was a voter, I would absolutely vote for it for a Best Animated Feature Oscar. Over Incredibles 2, over Wreck-It Ralph 2, It Breaks the Internet, and over Teen Titans Go and Isle of Dogs, I just think what Into the Spider-Verse did with its animation, with its storytelling, with the characters it was able to bring to life with, abs with you know, minimal backstory, but still make you invested in all these characters was really an incredible feat technologically, story-wise, and acting-wise. All three of those things combined for me to make an incredible movie that I walked out immediately wanting to go back in and watch again. And that should be the mark of a great film that should win an Oscar. So for me, yes, I do think so. It should win the Oscar, but we shall see with that superhero bias in the Academy. Well, it's, it's key that you bring it up mm -hmm. because if, again, just like you, if I were a voting member of the Academy, which one would get my vote? At this point in time, it, it is this. Mm -hmm. I, I had the privilege of seeing it a little later than you guys did, but mm -hmm. I'm so thankful that I finally got to see it. And just to plug it again, if you haven't already seen, I am just beyond myself right now that I get to host that Q&A with uh, the directors mm -hmm. and uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller on Monday night at the Arclight. You can enter to win tickets if the post is still up and running on Collider.com. But this is such an exciting achievement. Mm -hmm. So bringing back the superhero bias, mm -hmm. I guess you can call it, is that's really the only thing that I think might keep this movie down, yeah. especially when you're referencing movies like Ralph Breaks the Internet in particular, and also Incredibles 2. And I know Incredibles 2 has a superhero vibe to it, right. but those two movies, they feel like they're for maybe a broader or more widespread audience. They're, they're more of a crowd pleaser, even though mm -hmm. I found Spider-Verse to be a huge crowd pleaser. There are a lot of very specific things that they do to honor just the idea of a comic book and what it feels like to read a comic book. And the truth of the matter is different things, while many of us applaud them, it can be difficult for some to adjust to mm -hmm. it. And it is a very unique, different style of animation that I thought was absolutely mind-blowing and an immense achievement but the, it's kind of a double-edged sword yeah. in this kind of situation where that could maybe work against it but my vote goes to Into yeah. the Spider-Verse. And certainly I want to give a shout out. It's a culturally diverse film too with yes. the lead that is half black, half Puerto Rican, having that be a, a main part of the story. It's not a sequel movie like Incredibles 2 and Ralph Breaks the Internet that already have a foundation from the first two films that you can jump off of. This is itself its own thing. It does reference Its some own things, thing, but, but it also has the foundation of focusing on one of the most popular yes. superhero comic book characters of all time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a thing that I think I should probably probably save this for a review, but yeah. that's, that's the thing that they, they do so well too, is I think they found a really nice balance of, of kind of playing into the fact that we've seen the story so many mm -hmm. times over, but this is also a movie that is so accessible and, and positive for really young moviegoers yeah. that could be first getting into Spider-Man through this movie. Yeah. And I don't know, I just really appreciated the balance of those two things. Mm -hmm. For those adults that are old enough to remember, uh, it's, 
fun to see the emotion of it not go away yeah. and get treated with the right respect that it deserves, that that story deserves. You also talk about the diversity, and yeah. then there's also that idea that anyone can wear the mask, yeah. and that just radiates throughout the entire movie, mm -hmm. and it just speaks to the idea of it doesn't matter where you come from, what ethnicity you yep. are, how old you are, mm -hmm. you feel like you could be a part of this. What and gender you are, yeah, yeah I, none of it matters. Really, that really, yeah. really stuck with me. Agreed. Um, before we turn this yeah. into an extended Into the Spider-Verse review, <laughs> Do you want to read question number yeah, four? Let's move on. <laughs> this is on, from, on Instagram from at J Malloy1992. Writes, uh, hey guys, what is the issue with critics' hatred of nostalgia? In my opinion, I love to see Easter eggs and certain stories connect in a nice little bow. Is it just that we are overpowered with nostalgia or am I missing something? I am probably missing something like always, but I digress. You're not missing something mm. if it's your personal opinion, yeah. if it's the way you feel, but it's always nice to be open to other opinions. Mm -hmm. And my take on this question is, the first thing at least, is that I hesitate to make such a broad statement yeah. about critics' hatred of nostalgia. I mean, maybe you do read reviews that reference something like that, but I know many critics, and I know many critics that don't hate nostalgia. I most certainly don't hate nostalgia, and if I do criticize its use, it's because it, one, doesn't serve that immediate movie, that specific story well, or two, it takes me out of a movie. Actually, I'll add another thing. Three, it's something that makes me feel makes me feel like I'm I'm not part of the movie or I or I can't engage the same way as somebody who already knows the material. Those tend to be the three things that pop up that make me maybe speak negatively about the use of nostalgia and Easter eggs, something like that. A good example of a movie I think recently that did it well was Halloween. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of nods to the 1978 original, very specific visual choices, verbal references, things like that. But I think they all work in the story, the specific story that's playing out in the new Halloween movie where you don't feel like you're being left out if you don't know why a certain something, why, why maybe the audience around you is reacting because it still makes sense for that specific story. So if there is any criticism, I think it's nostalgia for the sake of nostalgia. Mm. And if that doesn't serve that movie well, why do it? Yeah, I might need to have a conversation with you about this because I don't understand the source of this complaint or this idea that critics hate nostalgia because I think a lot of people, just because they don't want Back to the Future remade doesn't mean they hate nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Is it more a matter of the references to previous stuff? Because Into the Spider-Verse, not spoiling anything, there are re nostalgia stuff in Into the Spider-Verse that really works as well. So I, I don't know that critics necessarily, this, this broad sweeping generalization, what is it born from? What is the foundation of it that you can think of? I don't know. I was actually, as you were mm. saying that, I was rereading the question and trying to connect certain dots and and, you know, uh, they write, I love to see Easter eggs and certain stories connect in a nice little bow. Yeah. I, you know, and in bringing up Into the Spider-Verse, the first thing that crossed my mind when you said that was, I wonder how many people out there, or at least how many critics out there, will describe the movie as as an excellent option for Spider-Man fans, because uh -huh. I think that it is that, but mm -hmm. I think it also steps beyond that. Yeah. And that to me is the way that you not only use nostalgia and connecting to other material that already exists, but yeah. that's the great greatest way you could adapt something. And so, okay. that's, why the, that's why the opportunity for adaptation excites me now more so than ever, because we're mm -hmm. starting to see things that aren't necessarily lazy rinse wash repeat but yeah. there are ways to expand a thing that was so great to so many people and make it great to even more people yeah and i think that we're going to see that in the terminator film next year how that's so. going to go back to uh linda hamilton and sarah connor but here's the deal that i would say then looking at this whole question and with the back and forth with perry here uh, i would encourage you to look at why specifically that specific critic is having an issue with the nostalgia in that movie does the criticism of it make sense criticism slash analysis. Remember that criticism is not just set it fire and burn it to the ground. Analysis is an important side of criticism. If you're reading that analysis and you're reading that criticism of the movie and you see that the nostalgia doesn't work, that it was shoehorned in or shoved in or used to just make people happy to, to distract them from the overall story that doesn't work in the film, then yes, that's a mistake of nostalgia. But if the nostalgia, as Perry stated, is weaved in seamlessly into the movie to give you an extra smile or happiness or make you grin in that moment from recognition and still make you appreciate the overall story, that's how nostalgia is used well. So if the critics have an issue, the critics as a generalization have an issue with nostalgia, it's most 
most likely the fact that it's forced in there or shoved in there rather than actually mm -hmm. being organically in the flow of the movie. And that seems to be where you, I would encourage you that you're not missing anything, but maybe do a little deeper dive into that. One more cool thing about yeah. well, well placed or well used Easter eggs is yeah. this idea of reverse nostalgia, where uh, if you are a newcomer and you jump into it and you don't necessarily know, but you fall in love with the character, the brand, the property, whatever it is, mm -hmm. so much that you wind up going back and then having this new appreciation for something you didn't get before, but something that maybe didn't distract you before. Yeah. That, I mean, what's better than that? Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. All right, uh, we got one more question okay. today. This one's an email, and it comes from Bruce Crawford, who writes... Hello, Collider. This is the first time I have ever talked about this to anyone, but for my entire life, I have felt ashamed for loving films. My biological and later adopted family and friends has put me down a lot and has made fun of my love for cinema. To be honest, it really hurts me because I always wanted to be in the film industry. I would love to have some type of career in talking about films. I fear, though, that my family and friends would make fun of me or put me down again for wanting to do what I have a passion and love for, which is movies. I was wondering if any of you had any encouraging advice for me, please. I really do look up to you all at Collider, and y'all are my role <laughs> models in life. Thank you. Oh, Bruce, that's a strong question. And here's what I would say to you, Bruce. Um, for First of all, follow what you believe, what your passion is. Stan Lee says that. We've seen it over and over again over these last uh, few weeks with these, or a couple weeks with these homages to Stan Lee talking about what, they ask him, what is the one advice you give to a young artist, young writer, whatever? And he said, work on the stuff that you love. It won't feel like work and then you keep pursuing it. And I would look, I would look at your situation in a very interesting way. The film business, loving films, being involved in film is a very difficult business to get into. Rejection is the, the, just the name of the game all the time. It is rare the person that walks in is successful right off the bat and has a great life. So the fact that your parents are, or, and your adopted family or your friends are making fun of your love for film or don't appreciate your love for film, that is that is a great battleground for you to develop a thick skin, a stronger skin. So when you walk into the film business, and you will, I believe that you will, you'll fight through all of this and climb out of this. Once you do, you'll have a stronger, tougher skin to deal with the rejection and the nose and be even more driven to succeed. This, you should look at this situation instead of a negative as a possible positive for you because it's toughening you up for what this business is really like. Movies are great. The, the, the utopian uh, ideal is great. Great. But in reality, it's a hard business to get into, hard business to survive and succeed in. And so this is a great kind of, I would call this like practice for the real thing for when you get out here in the business. And keep fighting. Don't let anyone tell you you don't want to do it. And you know what you do? If you cut them off, you, you could have your decision could be to cut them off and focus on finding friends who do support your love of cinema and go forward with that. Trust me, it does get better. I knew you'd be the perfect mailbag co-host to <laughs> have this question. Um, yeah, Bruce, I, I appreciate you you sharing this with us because yeah, any any time someone is is kind of like bullied or made fun of for something they love, it, it hurts my heart quite a bit. I don't want to give you the impression that. I necessarily know all the answers. So all I can really speak to you about is my personal experience with stuff like this. And I'm just so grateful that I have a family that has really mm -hmm. supported my passion and my love. And I mean, to be completely honest with you, I don't, I don't know how I would really handle it if maybe my passion and my love would drive me away from my family. So I don't want to speak to any of that. But the only thing that I've learned over the entire course of my career, every single year, the one constant that I could always look to and know that that is possibly pushing me in the right direction is just the idea of pursuing what I love and mm -hmm. what feels right to me. That's kind of always been my due north where it doesn't matter whether it's friends, families, other obligations, anything going on in the real world mm -hmm. that's kind of pulling my attention in one way or the other. If I'm trying to make a decision and I know that, that deep down, and sometimes that could be hard to pinpoint, but eventually you always get there if you think about it long and hard enough. But deep down, if whatever that is feels right I just take the leap and I go for it mm -hmm. and I've kind of always operated that way and it doesn't mean that every single leap you take is going to feel good in the end or land you in a positive place but it's just about continuing to take those risks that feel right and continuing to head towards that goal mm -hmm. and 
eventually if you fight for it long and hard enough, I feel like it's going to be within your reach. So I hope that helps a little bit, but I appreciate you sharing this with us because <laughs> yeah. maybe somebody out there is struggling with a similar situation. So putting yourself out there and being able to have a dialogue about it, it could help someone else too. Yeah, I think what Perry says is actually brilliant. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Don't forget that. It may feel like the race is short right now, but you've got a long way to go, Bruce. Take your time through it. Find those people who you can gravitate to who feel the same way you do. Perry's parents and family were supportive. My friends made fun of me all the time for loving films that I did. I got into international films really young, could, barely found any friends I could talk to about it. So I know what it's like to be made fun of. Let me tell you, you just keep fighting. That's what you have to do till you climb out of that situation and you get into a better area where you will find people who love what you love and you'll find a community. That's what we all have here. And you look, you say you look up to us a lot. If we can offer you any kind of role model advice, it's that find a community that believes in you as much as we all believe in each other here. It's so true. It's so nice yeah. to think that we all wound up together yeah. eventually. It's <laughs> like not all of film. my friends growing up had those same interests. Mm. Interests, but eventually, whether it's here at Collider or even thinking about my circle of friends mm. in New York, we, we all found each other That's somehow. How it goes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> thank you guys so much for sending in these questions. And as always, a huge thank you to you, Roka, for you. being here today. My pleasure. As always, I must remind you don't forget to like and share this episode of Collider Mailbag. And guess what? There's another one coming <laughs> your way tomorrow morning with Mark Riley. So I will see you again then. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.